sense of what was behind creation was a, a being from which I was separate, had no direct connection to, a being that was full of judgment, held on to grudges, and was willing to do something that no parent would do would be to punish its children forever with severe torment. And I was given, pointed to materials that, that were quote infallible that said that. <clears throat> so I would say the first thing is that I lived in fear from a very young age. No one does very well when they're acting out of fear. Never met that person. I experienced second thing that comes to mind in this moment and this is kind of all fresh for me. So the second thing that comes to mind to me is that that my experience was created by things external to me. Circumstances, people, what people said, what people did. So again, I woke up every morning disempowered because if you asked me, do you, do you think you'll have a good day today? I'd say, I don't know, because it depended very little on me. It depended on what happened that day and what other people said and did. And it even depended on how much I was attracted to and gave attention to things that had happened even many years ago that no longer existed, except as a thought. And to things that had not occurred, but might occur, that I would worry about possibly happening. It was as if every morning I, the metaphor that's come to mind frequently is Pinocchio. I was a puppet. I handed out strings unknowingly. Life had a string. What I thought God was had a string. People had a strings. And then when they jerked on their strings, I did my dance. My fearful dance or my angry dance or my righteous, arrogant dance. I love Sid's statement that I love, I mean, I think, I think this simple man. And I worried a lot, but I wasn't miserable, but I worried a lot. My mom taught me. She was a world champ warrior. So the bridge for I got away youth in Minneapolis. I've been there for a few years and I worked in the, in the usual way to find out what was wrong with people and then try and fix it. That got real exhausting. Because I could find, I could diagnose people and tell them what was wrong with them. But I didn't know how to teach people how to be happy. Had no clue. And nobody ever mentioned that in either undergraduate or graduate school. Nobody ever mentioned how to help people be happy. So I suppose it wasn't surprising that I didn't know how. So but anyway, one day my boss said somebody had invited him to 
a workshop at the University of Minnesota Graduate School and he couldn't go, did I want to go? And I didn't even care what it was about. I got two days off work, fine with me. So I went. It turned out it was three PhD psychologists from Florida who had spent some time with a man named Sid Banks. And that, that by itself didn't mean anything to me, but they started talking about what they had learned. And it turns out what they had learned that is that all human experience is created by our individual thinking. I didn't hear a whole lot after that. I thought the top of my head was going to come off because it was like, that's it. It was like, I knew that was the truth. And I'd like to say then, magically, I was transformed into this person that could fly and do miracles and all that. Not so. I spent the next, I don't know, weeks, months, throwing every argument I could at it. Because I, I wasn't used to kind of just taking somebody's word for something. So I remember thinking, okay. I'm a single mom with three kids. Half the time, I don't have enough money. I'm really tired. That can't be my thinking. That's not my thinking. That's the situation that's making me feel that way. And But then I would ask myself, well, does everybody in that same situation feel exactly the same way for exactly the amount of time I do? And I couldn't. I couldn't say yes to that. So I was willing to consider it might have something to do with thinking. But I would throw all kinds of things like that. Well, what if somebody dies? And what if this? And what if you get really sick? And what if somebody breaks up with you and all of that? That's not my thinking. Well, every time I said, but does everybody feel exactly the same way? Does everybody experience those circumstances in exactly the same way? And I could never come up with one that I could say yes to. So gradually I quit trying to disprove the whole thing and got more interested in the truth behind it. And I kind of, I've kind of been at that ever since. It's, it's not like uh, I think I'm done learning about it. On the other hand, it is so simple. It is so simple that you wouldn't think it would take forever to get good at it. But, but we're so used to all kind of believing everything we think. Getting caught up in a concept about love and think that's love. And you're wedded to that idea about what love is and what it should look like and how it should be. And so anybody that seemed to be behaving differently from that, you'd be very upset. Because I did that for years. You can get wedded. Concepts are of spirit, but they're not spiritual in nature. So if I get wedded to a spiritual idea, like I did for years and years and years, it still creates a kind of I'm spiritual, you're not, I'm right, you're wrong. This is the way it is, not how you see it. Innocently, so you have holy wars even, right? Which are just people wedded to different beliefs saying I'm, we're right, you're wrong. If you but believed what we believe, you'd be fine. And what Sid said is, like, that's normal. We all do that. And that's why we get upset with people or intolerant or impatient or righteous. We all do at times. But there's a feeling to that that lets us know we're wedded to thinking. And now when I feel tension, stress, or upset, not all the time, certainly, but a lot of the time now that feeling is like, oh, I thank, thank God I feel that way. It's letting me know I'm wedded to my thinking, period. And Sid, so Sid says, if you really see that your tension, stress, or upset, your insecurity is created from thought you're wedded to, this will happen. He said, I'll bring you right back to the now. 
why would I hold on to something that hurts me, that stresses me, that upsets me? Just like you put your hand on a hot stove. Why would I keep my hand on the stove if I know that's where the pain's coming from? And without technique, without theory, without belief, we take our hand off the stove. When, when I work with clients, when they really see that this uptight is th holding thought, they let go. No technique. I don't have to explain to them how to do it or teach them how to do it. They begin to more and more back away from their thinking rather than lean into it. Most adults, when they're having a problem or difficulty, think harder. And with understanding, you begin to, in a sense, think less. You fall into the unknown. Why? You find clarity there and you find peace of mind. And then out of that space of clarity, this deeper intelligence brings us new feeling that's uplifting and new thinking that's creatively responsive to any situation, any situation. So it's just understanding the principles is unfortunate because it's really standing under our intellect, not understanding it intellectual. I don't understand the infinite formless nature of life, I can intuit the truth of it. Insight. Oh, this too is thought. And it, it says, if you really see it, it'll bring you back to the now. And when we're in the now, we're like babies and babies and don't I'm get listening. stuck. And he started anything. talking about really simply about the positive. Now at that time, being positive in therapy was considered bad therapy, okay? That you weren't dealing with the person's pathology and you weren't getting in there with them with, with, with what was wrong with them. And so I thought to myself, positive, I, I could do positive. Like that's a little insight, right? Then we had a break and I went up to this physician and not thinking myself very intelligent, a doctor looked like they were like one step down from God. If you could get through medical school in my book, you were a special person. So I went up to him and I said, well, what do you think about this? And he said, well, I think it makes good common sense. I thought, well, if a doctor thinks it makes good common sense, I better pay attention. So I went back and now I had big ears. Now I was really interested because I wanted to talk about it at dinner. Really, it wasn't because I was looking to transform my life or do anything. I mean, I was miserable, but I was also pretty hopeless at the time that anything could help me except a husband. And so I went back and he put this chart on the, on the, on the wall. And all of a sudden, my reality shifted. And I realized what I thought was like, oh my God, I've been doing everything backwards. I've been doing my work backwards. I've been doing my life backwards. And I started to laugh so much because I realized that that's all it was. It was just backwards. And then I thought, oh my God, they found the cure to mental illness. Now I was had such a shift that happened that day, actually, I went, I had a client, I never went, went a whole day without seeing a client. So I had a client that was going to quit, because she wasn't getting better. And so I made everybody come in and have one final session with me before they quit. And so we were talking and I said, Well, you know, if you want to quit, that's okay, I understand. But I just want you to know, I went to a training today, I'm going to totally change my work. And this is what I'm going to do. And I did the best I could to talk about what I had just seen. And she said to me, she said, well, if you're going to do that, I'll stay. I was like, oh, my God, that was like the easiest conversation I ever had. And then I had another client in the morning and I did the same thing to them. And they like settled down and got into a better space. I was like, whoa, this is pretty powerful. So I go in the, go to the afternoon thing the next day and I walk in the door and everybody looks at me and like groans 
you know, like, oh, not her, she's here. Because of course they didn't know I had this big shift, right? So as I'm, as I'm talking, I, I brought up the cases. I, I mean, I had really severe cases of child abuse, sexual abuse, and domestic violence, people that I worked with said, will this work for this particular case? It was the worst case I had. And he said, yeah, they're human beings. It works for everybody. And I was like, hey, I'm in. And then, of course, I was really wanting to learn more about the principles. So I took Dr. Mills for a, a tour of Minneapolis. It was one of those days, you know, for those of you that live in the cold country, when it snows and the trees are all covered with white and the, it's got a thousand diamonds in the, in the snow glistening. And so I was driving him around now, just really wanting to learn more because I could feel myself transforming in, in the middle of this. And we went to his hotel and we were in the lobby of the hotel. 